Did you know CPAs work around the clock on taxes, audits? Yes, it's quite a shock. But business owners, they've got a dream. More tax saving strategy, that's what they need. Welcome to Welcome, everyone, to another exciting episode of Proactive Tax Strategies. I'm Patrice Sikora. Our host, Ken New, is owner of Pinnacle Financial Wealth Management and a team-based model consultant. He enjoys diving deep into the world of tax strategies. And today, we have a special guest back on the show with us, Darren Sugiyama, founder of Lionsmark Capital. Mr. Sugiyama started his own employee benefits firm in 2003 called Apex, and later founded Lionsmark Capital in 2016. It is now one of the most dominant premium financing intermediary firms in the life insurance industry. Darren is also an internationally acclaimed 11-time author, business coach, and mentor. Darren Sugiyama is back for a second episode of the Proactive Tax Strategies podcast to discuss premium finance life insurance so we can better understand this product and ask the question, Why don't we hear about this strategy more often? So without further ado, let me hand it over to Ken to kick things off. Ken, take it away. Thank you, Patrice. And hello, everyone. And welcome to Proactive Tax Strategies. So I'm your host, Ken New. Today, we're going to delve back into the intriguing subject of premium financing and really the role that it plays in tax strategies itself. So joining us again is my favorite expert in this field, Darren Tsujiyama. We had Darren on episode four. So if you haven't listened to that episode yet, go back, give a listen. Darren, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, glad to have you back here. In episode four, you and I discussed things like what is the premium financing and how does it fit in estate planning? And how can life insurance provide liquidity to estate taxes? We also touched on the Bushibo Code of Samurai and how it relates to your work and your advocacy for expanding premium financing to populations beyond millionaires and why it's so important to educate clients about the risks and the benefits of premium financing. And even more than that, why don't you give us your thoughts on some of those subjects there and then we can dive into our episode today. Sure. Premium finance life insurance as a whole, I think, has been a very exclusionary type of strategy reserved for the, what I would call uber wealthy, 25 million in net worth and up. In that space, premium finance life insurance is kind of a normal tool to implement within someone's overall estate plan. But when you start going down below a $25 million net worth, it's used less and less. And financial professionals, CPAs, and obviously clients are really not aware of the value that premium finance life insurance can have in their estate planning. And even more importantly, in some cases, a way to really supercharge their retirement income. Several years ago, we went to a lot of the institutions and we said, you know, there are clients that have high incomes that are not worth 25 million at the moment that we think premium finance life insurance would be a good solution for. So when we started to kind of redesign the traditional method of premium financing and and reducing risk and having the clients have a little bit more skin in the game, uh, that really changed the landscape in the space for folks like that. Yeah, it's interesting that you use the word reduce the risk. Maybe you can expand on that for just a minute. I, I use this analogy quite a bit, drawing parallels between buying real estate with a mortgage loan and buying live insurance using premium financing. Similar to purchasing real estate with a mortgage loan, the more money you put down and the less you mortgage, the less risk that the buyer slash owner incurs. And the reason is that if they were in a situation where they had to get out of that home or out of that piece of real estate and they don't have enough equity in that property, if the loan balance is greater than the value of the property, in order to get out, that client is going to have to write 
a substantial check, right? Just to get out. Not a problem if they have the liquid funds to be able to do that. But if they don't, uh, they can find themselves in a kind of a rough situation. Conversely, if they put a larger down payment down, even if the property values decreased, obviously they wouldn't be happy about it. But the loan balance might actually be the same or less than the value of the property. So in that scenario, the client could sell the property and essentially walk away at kind of a break-even point. They take a loss on the value of the property, but they wouldn't have to write a big check. Though that scenario is not ideal, at least the client is not in a situation where they need to come up with liquid and they don't have the liquid. Similar to the world of premium financing, if the client pays in some premium out of pocket and they're not 100% leveraged, it allows them a lot more flexibility if life changes in the future, if their income goes down or if they just decide that they need to move in a different direction. The more equity they have in the policy, the healthier their loan to value ratio is and the healthier that LTV is, the better everything looks on a balance sheet for the client. Yeah. Yeah. So you strike a balance there and and that makes a lot of sense. So let's dive in then to take a look at a, how you would advise someone. So imagine this then. You've got a young professional, let's call her Emily, and she's been saving. She's saving for retirement and she's considering various investment vehicles. So she could be looking at a traditional IRA or a brokerage account. And now if Emily were to come to you with this question, how would you guide her? And that question is, is cash value life insurance, like we're talking about putting cash in the game, skin in the game here, is cash value life insurance policy a good instrument for retirement planning? It's a great question. My simple answer is it depends. <laughs> it depends on a lot of <laughs> sure. different variables. The first thing it's going to depend on is how old is, is she and what type of health is she in? The better her health is, the lesser the cost of insurance. So in our business, we call the COI, cost of insurance is largely based on the difference between the cash value and the death benefit. The unhealthier the person is, the higher the cost of insurance. And so that creates a drag on the growth of that cash value. So if someone is too old and or too unhealthy, it may not make sense for them to do this. So that's, the, that's kind of where we start. Uh, the second thing is, is she married and does she have kids? Are there people that depend on her earned income to where if she were to pass away unexpectedly early, car accident, cancer, stroke, something awful like that, those people that depend on her would no longer have her earned income because she's deceased. And so the life insurance death benefit becomes extremely valuable for someone in that scenario. So even if they were doing this mostly for retirement, it's also, I think, really important to understand what does their life look like in terms of their loved ones that count on their earned income. So that would be another factor to weigh in. And these are just a few of several, several factors. The last one I'll touch on is what type of profession is Emily in, right? If she is an entrepreneur and takes big risks in her business, that's one thing. If she's a cardiologist, that would be a little bit different. Now, if she's a cardiologist in private practice versus a cardiologist working for a gigantic medical group as a W-2 employee, that would be different as well. So there's all these things that, that we need to look at to determine whether or not premium finance life insurance is the right thing for that particular client. So many variables there. It sounds like life insurance was interwound into the strategy and you really need to get to know the individual and what the purpose of the insurance is versus the death benefit. Um, so let's focus for a moment though on the cash value. And let's dive into those options that really help enhance this type of strategy. There are a lot of choices out there. Of course, cash could be put into 401ks, or they could be put into Roth IRAs. And it seems like there's all these different options that are out there. So how would you go through those options? And what would the alternatives look like? Yeah, I think when you look at retirement options for folks, the standard one that kind of default that everyone goes to is a 401k that has a similar tax treatment to an IRA, right? And, and the common view on that is that, well, it's better to invest pre-tax dollars, right? Because you get more in as opposed to after-tax dollars. 
for some people, maybe that's not a bad scenario. However, for folks that are a relatively high income, whose income is going to continue to increase over time, all they're doing is kicking the tax implication down the road. And if you ask them, do you think that taxes are going to go up or down in the future? I don't know anyone that thinks that taxes are going to go down. So then what happens is they have this kind of phantom value in their IRA or their 401k. And the reason I say it's a phantom value is that that is not the actual dollars that they get to net in their pocket at the end of the rainbow. They're going to pay income taxes on that amount. As an example, if someone has saved, say, a million dollars in their IRA or 401k, if they were to liquidate that fund of a million dollars, it would be as if they actually made a $1 million income in that year. So that million dollars is going to be taxed at the highest tax bracket level. So in the state of California, where I live, you're essentially losing a little over half to Uncle Sam. And that's something that a lot of folks don't really take into consideration. Another alternative would be to do a Roth IRA. Roth IRA is after tax dollars going in, it grows tax-free, and then it actually is able to be liquidated tax-free. But the downside of a Roth is if you make over 200000 a year in income, you do not qualify for a Roth. And even if you made less than that and you did qualify, the maximum you can put in is between you know six to $7,000, depending on your age. The question, I guess, is why would the IRS put that strict a governor on who can invest in a Roth IRA? In my estimation, the reason is that uh, the tax treatment on a Roth IRA is so valuable to the individual that the IRS wants, you know, they want their taxes, right? They want their money. So if the tax treatment is more favorable to the individual, then the IRS would, in my opinion, would want to restrict uh, who can put money in there and how much they can put in. Now, if you just kind of take that tax treatment on the Roth IRA and apply that to other investments slash retirement options, the question then is what other asset is treated from a tax standpoint is treated like a Roth IRA? Now, the answer is there's only one product that is has the same tax treatment as a Roth IRA, and that is a cash value life insurance policy. From a tax treatment standpoint, using the life insurance policy, not only for the death benefit, but also for the cash value accumulation and the future retirement income stream that can be generated, uh, again, from tax standpoint, it can be extremely valuable to the individual. I hear you point out the limitations as the income goes up and the desire to fund those policies with more and more cash, more and more capital then it starts to lend itself towards the whole idea of cash value life insurance. So now let's take a look at this leverage of the cash value life insurance, the viability, if you will, of the premium financing. And how does that help to lever and create higher uh, contributions and things of that nature? Again, I'll, I'll go back to the concept of using a mortgage loan to purchase real estate. This is not exactly how premium financing works. However, I think this analogy will kind of drive the point home from a conceptual standpoint. If someone were to buy a house or a piece of property, they could either pay for it cash or they could use leverage in the form of a mortgage loan. So I'll give you some rounded numbers here. Let's say if someone were to buy a $10 million property, and although this is not the way a mortgage loan works, this is the way a premium finance loan would work. So we're going to pretend that we're in this environment where we could purchase real estate using a loan structure that's similar to a premium finance live insurance loan structure. So let's say the seller would agree to have you pay him $1 million a year for the next 10 years for that $10 million property. And now let's imagine if you could go to a bank and borrow $1 million per year over that 10-year period. So in the first year, you'd borrow a million dollars. In a premium finance loan arrangement, you would pay interest only on that million dollars. Let's say the interest rate was 7%, just as a hypothetical example. 7% of the million dollars would be $70,000. You'd pay $70,000 in interest. The next year, if you borrowed another $1 million loan from the bank. Now your loan balance is 2 million. Assuming the borrowing rate was still 7%, you'd pay 7% on the 2 million, which would be 140,000. 
and so on and so on and so on. By the time you got to the end of the 10th year, you would have paid $3.75 million in interest, right? Under those assumptions. Conversely, if you were to make the same payments, so your total out of pocket was $3.75 million. If you bought a $3.75 million house, right? Cash, no bank loan whatsoever. And you compare those two assets side by side. Let's assume they both appreciated at 7% in value annually. So over the course of 10 years, properties would essentially double in value, right? So now your $10 million property is worth $20 million, and your $3.75 million property is worth you know, a little over $7 million. Well, the property that you mortgaged, remember, you still owe the bank $10 million. But if the property value increased from $10 million to $20 million, your gross value of that property is $20 million. The bank loan is $10 million. So if you back out the bank debt, the net value of that property after 10 years would actually be $10 million. $20 million gross value, $10 million net value. However, the gross value and the net value of the non-finance property would only be just a little over $7 million. That's just a, a rough sketch of where leverage can really work to the buyer's advantage. doesn't work for everyone. The client has to be the right type of client. We can talk a little bit about who the right client is later on this call. But if we identify the right client that has the right financial wherewithal and the right risk tolerance, et cetera, et cetera, right timeline horizon, premium finance life insurance can be incredible, not only from a death benefit and estate planning standpoint, but also from a retirement income standpoint as well. Great example. Yeah. I am sure that there are objections out there. And so what are some of the common objections that you get and what what are the naysayers saying about this? What what are some of the the basics there? Yeah. So you've got kind of two sides of the house (laughs) in terms of how Mm -hmm. they perceive using life insurance as a retirement tool. And then you layer on premium financing on top of that. And both sides get even more extreme and more polarizing in their stance on this. On one end, you have these, I'll just call them overzealous sales folks <laughs> that they love the concept of premium financing. They think everyone should do it. They're a hammer and everyone they see is a nail and they just go out there and just try to sell the daylights out of premium financing to everyone with a heartbeat. That's not the right approach. On the other end of of the spectrum, you have, as you call them, the naysayers, right? People that think that life insurance in general, cash value life insurance in general, is not a good investment, does not give you a good return on investment. And both of those extreme stances are rarely rooted in any sort of mathematical truth. They're like feelings and opinions about this topic. They are a bunch of philosophers I am not a philosopher. I'm a mathematician. And what I do with clients that are looking at this is I take all of the uh, elements that make up their life, age, health, marital status, family arrangement, liquidity, income, type of industry they're in, et cetera, et cetera, to really determine whether or not using this as a retirement tool is appropriate. For some folks, it is. For some folks, it is not. And I will always say that even if you're using this for retirement planning purposes, it's still extremely important to not discount the value of the actual life insurance death benefit component. So I'll use myself as an example. I am 52 years old. I'm married, have a 14-year-old son. I have a pretty sizable mortgage. I have a mortgage on my vacation home. I have a kid. My kid's in private school. We have expenses, right? My life insurance policy is premium financed. I also have a policy on my wife that is also premium financed. The main reason we're doing this is, again, from a tax treatment standpoint, it is a very efficient tool to use in our overall portfolio for retirement planning purposes. However, in the short term, I do have a life insurance need, right? If I die in a car accident tonight, my wife and son miss out on all the income that I would have earned between now and retirement. Uh, my wife is kind of superwoman. <laughs> She's a career woman, but also is CEO of our household and runs our house. And so even she makes a pretty considerable income herself. But even if she uh, was not an income earning spouse, she is a mother and she does run our, our home. If she were to die in a car accident, forget her earned income uh, for just a second. 
just the value that she brings to the table in terms of running our household, I would have to replace what she does with an employee, right? Mm -hmm. And so the, the death benefit on her policy is, is valuable to me as well. When we look at the purpose of the life insurance policy, it serves several different purposes. One, obviously the death benefit. Two, obviously the retirement income stream that we would enjoy on a tax-free basis. And my perspective on taxes, as I, I do not see taxes going down in the future, I think they're only going to go up. And so being able to contribute to something that grows tax-free, that I could also enjoy tax-free income in the future, that also serves as an insurance policy to insure my income during my income earning years, that's killing a lot of birds with one stone. So it's, it's a very efficient tool to have in your toolbox when it comes to family planning, estate planning, retirement planning. Yeah, absolutely. The two pillars that I'm hearing you talk about profoundly is the use of life insurance itself for the death benefit. And I mean, that's a core product. Life insurance is income replacement and serves many needs there for sure. And at the same time, though, the cash value component growing tax free, arguably tax free, and then you can extract that money out of there tax free. So over a timeline, you've got the protection component of life insurance and you've got the tax free growth and distribution on the back end. I mean, it really is one of those one size fits all kind of solutions. It helps in a lot of ways, but I mean, it's so powerful of a strategy yet it still remains underutilized. Imagine if the regulations changed and anybody, including high income earning folks and what I would consider wealthy folks, high net worth folks, imagine if the restrictions came off of the Roth IRA and you could contribute as much as you wanted to a Roth IRA with the same tax treatment, tax-free growth and tax-free distributions or drawdowns in the future. And then on top of that, imagine that if God forbid something happened and you died in the second year of contributing, you would get a 1,000% plus return and just one big windfall, regardless of how much is in your Roth. Imagine if there was this quote unquote death benefit attached to it, right? That's essentially a, a cash value life insurance policy. Now imagine on top of that, if you could borrow money from a bank in the same way that you borrowed money from a bank to buy your house to invest in this new, newly imagined Roth IRA thingy, right? That also has this death benefit thingy attached to it as well. And then on top of that, imagine that there was a quote unquote investment strategy or an investment platform inside that fictitious Roth IRA where it had a 0% floor. So if the market was down 30%, you wouldn't lose 30% of your Roth IRA value. And it had a 0% floor, like a stop loss feature. And then imagine in order to get that, you'd have to give up some of your upside. So let's say the maximum you could earn in this hypothetical Roth IRA thing is 12%. So let's say you're playing somewhere between a 0% return and a 12% return, but not a negative return and a return never greater than 12% that would reduce risk in the person's overall portfolio substantially. And you could even argue that if this thing existed and was implemented in someone's portfolio, it would allow them to be more ambitious and more adventurous in their other investments within the portfolio, where they could invest in things that maybe they could afford to take on a little bit more risk in hopes of getting a greater return because this Roth thingy with a death benefit with the 0% floor, right, gave them more certainty and took some kind of chips off the table, so to speak. Uh, that would be amazing. Well, this fictitious Roth IRA thingy that I just explained, that is essentially the way a cash value life insurance policy works, specifically an indexed universal life insurance policy. And if you could use that leverage and purchase this in a similar way that you would purchase a home with a mortgage loan, well, then that's not all that different than a premium financed IUL policy. What I attempt to do is help people understand this because it does feel like a foreign concept. I'm, I try to help them understand this new foreign concept, foreign to them, not with the wealthy $25 million and up folks, 
but with someone that's earning, say, half a million dollars a year and maybe has a net worth of, quote unquote, only a few million, they've probably never heard of this before, but but they're probably in a mortgage loan. They probably financed the purchase of their car. They probably took out student loans to put themselves through school. They're no strangers to the concept of leverage. They just haven't been exposed to using leverage when it comes to purchasing a life insurance policy and potentially using that life insurance policy as part of their overall retirement plan. Perfect. And I see now why the uber wealthy, the 25 million plus group really is attracted to this kind of strategy from a theory perspective. And now for those that aren't quite as high net worth, we work with their CPAs and help them to buy into this whole concept. That's one of the challenges working with CPAs because CPAs are not paid or compensated based on improving the financial situation of their clients, right? They are paid to keep their clients out of tax court and typically just filing their tax returns. They're typically not real proactive in terms of looking for creative solutions to put their clients in a better financial situation overall. I understand if the CPA is not incented to do that, the path of least resistance is to just file their tax returns and do what most non-wealthy folks do, right? Just kind of go with status quo. The other thing that would require, what learning about this would require the CPA, they would have to learn a ton of content in the higher net worth realm. So if the CPA is used to working with folks that are 25 million, 50 million, $100 million net worth estates, then they're probably a lot more fluent in this type of strategy. If their bread and butter client is not worth 25 million and up, well, then there would really be no need for them to learn about these types of strategies because they weren't built for their target clientele. It doesn't, however, mean that it isn't right for some of their clients. If a client is using a CPA who is not used to working with high net worth individuals, then that CPA is just not going to be fluent in this type of strategy. And perhaps that client should find a CPA that does work with folks of that net worth. And maybe they would be more fluent in using these types of strategies. Yeah. So the whole idea there is to, uh, I suspect anyways, is to uh, go through the math, go through the examples to help them to understand even those that have the capacity to take on higher concept type strategy really need to get into the details and work through the details. It seems like the next journey for us is to get into some specific examples and maybe walk through a live case. A, a case I was looking at this morning actually was on a 50-year-old male. Most folks that are entrepreneurs, small business owners, at age 50, they are just starting to really kind of hit their stride and, and bring in some pretty good income. However, up until that point, most of their discretionary income was reinvested back into their business, right, to build their company. And so I talked to a lot of folks in their early 50s, mid 50s, even late 50s, quite frankly, that feel almost embarrassed that they don't have this you know, sizable nest egg for their retirement saved up because they've invested so much back into their business. Some of these folks, they have this almost kind of despair about them because they're afraid that they don't have enough years left ahead of them to save a substantial amount to fund their retirement. When we talk about using premium finance life insurance for folks like that, the premium financing piece of it, the leveraged piece, really turbocharges their gains because we're using, again, the bank's capital to inject more premium into these policies. Uh, again, if you were trying to make money on real estate, it'd be pretty difficult at age 50 or 55 to buy a house cash. You probably wouldn't, probably wouldn't have all that much cash saved up. So you buy a very small house and then that house is only going to appreciate in value so much. Okay. So let's say this 50 year old had a hundred thousand dollars a year to park somewhere, right? And let's say they're going to do this over a 10-year period. So $100,000 a year for 10 years. If they were to put that $100,000 into a non-finance life insurance policy versus put that $100,000 into a premium finance life insurance policy that's supercharged with that additional capital going into the policy 
that they're borrowing from the bank. Uh, this 50-year-old example that I was looking at, the premium finance policy gets them a little over double the death benefit and a total financial benefit over time, meaning retirement income drawdowns and cash value at the end of a 40-year period. The premium finance policy outproduces the non-finance policy 1.64 times, so almost double. If we compare the client putting that $100,000 a year into a non-insurance-based investment account, right, like the stocks and bonds account, after taxes, after investment fees, et cetera, the premium finance life insurance policy from a cash value standpoint is going to create 2.47 the non-insurance-based investment account, you know, almost two and a half times the amount. That doesn't even include the benefit of the actual death benefit of the policy. So if we were only looking at returns and cash growth in that premium finance life insurance policy compared to a non-insurance-based investment account for this particular client that I'm talking about, it's not even close, right? Two and a half times the cash flow death benefit at retirement. So every client's different. We always want to take a look at the very specific details of each individual client. And for the clients that this is not right for, I'll be the first one to say this is not for you. This You should definitely not do this. And for clients that this is really perfectly designed for, it just becomes a no-brainer. Great example. So Darren, you've written a book about premium financing, and I'd love to be able to get one of those books out to our listeners out there. And so anyone who is interested in taking a deeper dive into premium financing, take a look at our website, Pinnacle Financial Wealth, MGMT.com. And we'll make sure that you get a copy of the, of the book, Premium Financing by Darren Sujiyama. Also give us a call at 321-454-3623. Be happy to get you in touch with Jenny Duro and she'll get you a book and we'll wrap things up now. Darren, any last minute thoughts you have on premium financing and how it applies to our listeners? Yeah, I think when it, when it comes to things like premium financing, though it can be a really effective tool for the right type of client, as I said earlier, sometimes this is not the right fit for the client. And you have to be very, I guess, aware of people out there that are marketing premium finance life insurance because a good large majority of them are really, they're in it for themselves more so than the client. They're, in my estimation, extremely overly aggressive and, and they're recommending this to clients that really should not be doing this at all. So you have to be responsible, right? Like, like anything in life, anything that's good in life can also be used for evil. And so you want to make sure that a premium finance life insurance is used for good and not evil. And it's all in the design and who you're working with. Yeah. So get the details and make sure that, that you understand what you're getting yourself involved in. And I think you've done a great job to frame the generality of premium finance. And I think the listeners will get a lot out of that. Again, love to get the information to you. Darren, thank you for your time today. Great presentation. Oh, glad to be here. All right. And gentlemen, that was a very, it's a wonderful discussion of premium financing. Thank you. And listeners, we hope you found this information valuable. We remind you to follow this podcast for more proactive tax strategies. They will come in future episodes. I'm Patrice Sikora, and thank you for being with us. Thank you for listening to the Proactive Tax Strategies podcast. Click the follow button to be notified when new episodes become available. Visit our website at www.pinnaclefinancialwealthmanagement.com or give us a call at 321-454-3623. Securities offered through Arete Wealth Management, LLC, members FINRA and SIPC. Investment advisory services offered through Arete Wealth Advisors, LLC, an SEC registered investment advisory firm. Pinnacle Financial Wealth Management, Arete Wealth Advisors, and Arete Wealth Management are independent entities.